Yaakov Avinu, on his deathbed, calls for his sons, beginning of Perak Memtad, and tells them, Assemble yourselves, and I will tell you what will befall you in the end of days. And then he continues, Gather yourselves and listen, O sons of Yaakov, and listen to Israel, your father. And this is a very famous medrash, which the Gemara Psachim, source number three, brings down. The Gemara talks about why do we say Baruch Shem Kivo Machuso Lam Ve'ed quietly in a whisper, and the Gemara replies that um, the statement does not appear there as a verse in the Torah. The Gemara replies in the name of Rabbi Ben Lakish that when Yaakov Avinu was on his deathbed, he wanted to reveal the end to. Um, when, when the end would come. But when Yistakami Menushchina, the Divine Presence, left him. So at that point, Yaakov Vinu got very scared. He said, Amar Hashem HaChas HaShalom Yesh V'mitabtipsu Perhaps, God forbid, there is a blemish in one of my children. To which his sons responded, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu HaShem Echad. Listen, Israel. And just parenthetically, the Amos Yaakov points out, a question always bothered me, how could they call their father Yisrael by his first name? This was a Torah of Kavod. This really wasn't his name. This was a name given to him out of honor, so uh, it, it, it was appropriate to uh, to say this. They say, "Kesheim she'ein belibcha ela echad." Just as you have on your mind one, "Kachem belibenu ela echad." Also, on our heart, there's one. Shema Yisrael, listen, Yisrael, our Father. Hashem alokenu, Hashem echad, Hashem is one. There's no psul. There's nothing. You know, there's not a child like Yishmael or Esav who's gone off. When Yaakov Avinu hears this. He opened Patach Yaakov Amar. He said his response was Baruch Shem Kavo Machuso Lamvet. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. Gemara then goes on and says, but it's very nice that Yaakov Inu said this, but when Moshe Rabbeinu gave over the Torah, it's not part of the Shema. So, on the one hand, Yaakov Inu said this after Shema, on the other hand, it's not found in the Chumash. So that's why we say it quietly. And the Gemara gives as a uh, parable of a princess who smelled the aroma of a seasoned stew. It really wasn't appropriate for her to request to eat of it. Not so uh, befitting for her. It's disgraceful. But she really wanted it. So her servants gave it to her quietly. My friends, there is a tremendous amount to learn on this piece of Medrash, on this Gemara. <laughs> What does it mean that Yaakovina wanted to tell them the Kates, the end, that's a Shiri Sneatzvo? How they respond of Shema Yisrael, why they respond this way, it's a Shiri Sneatzvo. There's so much to, to say here that uh, one has to limit oneself in, in, in learning, and that's what we're going to do, as difficult as it is, to one question. We see that Kriya Shmati Ferret Shimshon Rav Pinkis is has Mamash Hayso Chela Yudi Mamish the foundations of a Jew, and in the middle of Kriya Shma we have Shma Yisrael Nen Vahafta. In the middle we have this line Baruch Shem Fo Machuso Lam Ve'Ed. Bless is God's name, His kingship forever, which is not a pasuk in the Chumash, and uh, but yet it's put here, so it obviously has some significance, and we say it quietly. So we have to ask ourselves, what is significant of saying this quietly, our wondrous whisper of Baruch Shem? And I'll, I'll say at the outset, even before we begin, that Baruch Shem, this, this statement, and we'll get a sense of it at the beginning of our year, is one of the deepest statements that you can imagine. We end with Anna Bekalach, with Baruch Shem, Every phrase, Baruch, shame, the Kvo, the Malchuso, Lolam Va'ed, has worlds and worlds of depth. It's the Shira of the Malachim, of the angels. And, and the Shira could be a completely esoteric Shira for one hour where we would understand absolutely nothing. So in order to avoid that, I were to try albeit we will have to be up in the clouds a little bit, but to bring her parachute down as much as possible. And I therefore selected among the spurring and among the writings things that I felt were much more concrete that we could relate to 
but let us all be aware that really to do justice to what Baruch Shem Kvam Achaz was about, it really has to be an esoteric shir. Having said this, let's try to understand many, many ideas of why do we whisper this, what should we be thinking about when we say this in a whisper, and obviously we'll touch upon why on Yom Kippur we say this phrase out loud. So the first reason Tiver Chimshon in his Bamarim on Chumash brings down from the Rambam, we say it quietly, to make a distinction between what is found in the Chumash of Shema Yisrael and that which is a Mesorpi Adenu Miyakov Avinu and that which is a, transmitted to us through the Mesorah through Yaakov Avinu. So we say it quietly so we know that's not part of Chumash. That, my friends, is a very easy, simple answer. Then the Tiferet Chimshon goes on, and he quotes here the Nefesh Achayim. The Nefesh Achayim says, what does it mean, Baruch Shem? Baruch is Moshom Brecha, as a pool, as drawn down. To Shmo Shal HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Yufatz, in the Aaron 7, V'yufur Sam Ba'olam, that Hashem's name, Baruch, should be manifested, should be expanded throughout the world. What is a shame? A shame is the Mahutosh. It's the essence, right? The essence of Hashem should be manifested in this world. And Rafika says something very fascinating. He says, a name is how we recognize ourselves and how we interact. And he says, imagine if you were like a Robinson Crusoe on an island for years. He said you would forget your name because you never use it. Because your name is the way you identify with other people. But if you're by yourself, you never use your name. I usually don't call yourself. Right? You are yourself. So, um... Kasher Shem Hashem mitparsem ba'olam. When the name of Hashem, Baruch Shem, when the name of Hashem is manifested in the world, says the Nefesh Achayim, Shigadu Toha Nara Bali Devi Tui Ba'olamenu Vilignei Glenko Zeo Baruch Shem. If God's name, God's essence is manifested in the world, that's what Baruch Shem is all about. Um, and that everyone should recognize the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and that everyone should have an understanding of the Kaddish Baruch Hu. But... Why is it said quietly? So he says, in the asterisk and eight, needs to name, is a shevach yoter gadol shema Yisrael baruch shem. If you have to ask yourself, what's a greater praise of Hashem? That shema Yisrael, that Hashem alokeno Hashem achad, the uniqueness of Hashem, the oneness of Hashem, there is no other. Or baruch shem, that uh, Hashem's Greatness is manifested in the world. He says, compared to Shema Yisrael, Baruch Shem isn't a shevach at all, really isn't a praise. Why? And this is very fascinating. He says, what you're saying, and saying Baruch Shem, says Nefesh Achayim, is that God is the king over the millions of people. But if I were to tell you that a king is a king over a million ants, would you take that as a praise? No, because the ants are nothing compared to a king. We are nothing compared to Hashem. So we're entering into philosophy here. I'm trying to avoid. But really, if God is everything, and God is, is, is the essence of the whole world, we're really nothing in comparison to Hashem. So to say that Hashem rules over us, and that He's, he's manifested His kingship over our world, it's like saying that there's a king over a thousand or a million ants. It's, is that really a praise? No. So since it's really not a praise, we say it quietly. But since it is such a beautiful idea that God is indeed king, we say it. It's like that muscle of the food. It's tasty, but it's really, you know, not so respectful. To say Baruch Shem lacks a little bit of respect because we're saying that to whom is God a king over? He's over us, right? That God's kingship should be manifested over us, and we are, we know, are nothing compared to Hashem. So, first idea, why is it said quietly? The Rambam, because Yaakov Inu said it, to make a distinction between that which is in the Chumash and then the Sorah. The second answer is because it's, although it's a tremendous praise, it's a limited praise because who are we saying God is rulership over? Over us who are really nothing. The third is the Maharal in Source 10. The Maharal says that Baruch Shem is even a greater praise than Shema Yisrael. Everyone can say Shema Yisrael. But Baruch Shem is on such a high level that only Yaakov Avinu can say it. So he says, for example, if we were to tell a simpleton that you know this person is a Gadol Hador, so they would say, wow, he's a Gadol Hador, he must be the most gigantic person in the world. Gadol being big. 
right? Tool, not God, they'll be great, right? We're, we're limited in our understanding. So bar of shame is so great that we don't even understand when we say it. So therefore, since we have no understanding of what we're saying, because it's beyond us, it's something that the Yaakov Avinu can say, something that the Malachim, the angels can say, we whisper it because it's beyond us. So ask Ruth Pincus, well, hold on a second. Is it something that's beyond us? as the Maral is saying, or is it something that the Nefesh Chaim is saying is not such a great praise to Hashem, that he is king over, you know, us, little, minuscule human beings. So, um, Rav Pincus reconciles this in a very beautiful way. He says, when we talk about that Hashem created the world, and that we talk about that Hashem is king over the world, in a real way, the fact that Hashem is king over us, albeit that we are very small, that is indeed the greatest of all praises. And he says, let's take for example in 12a and 12b, that uh, Og Melech Abashan, who we know was a tremendous giant. Let's imagine we say that Og lifted up a mountain, of, you know, a very heavy mountain. Would that be a praise? No, because Og was a giant. Then if I said... Og was able to enter into an ant's hole. Wow, that would be a praise. That Og, who is this giant, can be able to, to make himself so small to enter into a ant hole, to do something so counter what we would expect, that's great praise. The fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who is Shema Yisrael in 12b, Echad HaMeyuchat, you are God of awesome Kokach, that Hashem, who is so great, Hashem who fills this world and there is no other, that who gam Baruch Shem, who benigul HaMahuto, in counter to his essence, he's also able to, or counter to what we were to believe to be, he's able also to rule over Lama Shafel, Zel That's the greatness. So when we're saying that Bar Shem is even greater than Shema Yisrael, what does that mean? It means that Bar Shem is to tell you how great HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in the fact that he is able to be the king over us, us lowly things. That in itself is the greatness greatest of all praises. Ah, what does this mean? That's why it's beyond our understanding. That's why we say it quietly. That Shema Yisrael is the truth, the greatness of Hashem. Baruch Shem Ivate Pela Kol Yachol. It's the wonder of the all-encompassing God. Shem Davar Homet Kinegdo, that nothing stands in front of Him. And that's why Baruch Shem is both the, the greatest of all praises, as well as a praise that is beyond our understanding, and hence we say it quietly. This idea of Baruch shame being something that's beyond our understanding, that Baruch shame is something that's the world of the Malachim, on the one level we just saw this meant that Hashem, the fact that He's able to rule over us who are small, small, and Hamagbi la Shavet, and He comes down to our world, is involved in our world. That's the greatest praise imaginable. And it's beyond our understanding to understand how Hashem, who's called Yachol, can be so intimately involved in each and every one of our lives. So because of that, this just doesn't stem with us. We say it quietly because it's beyond our understanding. Or Baruch Shem is said quietly um, based on the Manat Chaim in the Gemara 13. The Gemara says that when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shemaim, he heard this praise of the angels and he brought it down to earth. But he didn't want the angels to be envious of us, that we he almost like stole it from heaven. So we say it quietly. And hence, on Yom Kippur, when we're a level of angels, we're able to say it out loud. And the Matnat Chaim offers perhaps another view of why is Baruch Shem the praise of the angels that we don't understand it. He says it's because Baruch Shem is about being able to realize that Hashem's presence, His Malchus, is forever. And the way he manifests in this world is forever. So when things go well, I understand that God's manifestation of his covenant, of his glory, is clear.
Where the challenge comes, while the Malachim could say this out loud, and the Yaakov Avinu on his deathbed could say this out loud, that he was in a point of transition between this world and the next world, and has a completely different view of this world. It's the challenge of being able to see that all that happens in this world is for the good. That Baruch Shem Kivon Machuso Lolam Va'ed, that Hashem's manifestation of His name, of His essence, is Kvod Machuto, that everything that happens is the reflection of the honor of Hashem's Malchus, of Hashem's kingship forever. It's hard for us to see when things are challenging and difficult in our lives. The Nefesh Shimshon in his Sefer on Amunah Bitochon in 17 notes, when people say everything the merciful one does is for the good, they think it means that even if Hashem punishes, which is bad, in the end it will be for the good. It is worthwhile for a person to undergo this bad punishment so that later he will be able to go to Olam Haba. But if this is what it means, then it's not a pella. It is something that can be understood. However, this is not so. The Gemara says, the next world is not like this world. In this world, over good tidings, we say, Baruch HaTav HaMeti. And over evil tidings, we say, Baruch Dynamis. In the next world, everything is Baruch HaTav HaMeti. If it were true that the meaning of everything that merciful one does is for the good, is that everything will eventually be for the good, that even this world, we would say, HaTav HaMeti, over ill tidings. We don't see the good, but we know that everything is for the good. We believe that it's so. Having understood this point, why should we recite HaTav HaMeti? And the answer is that everything the merciful one does is for the good. Rather means as follows. Everything that happens and everything that Hashem created is good. But in a wondrous, totally incomprehensible way. It's a pella. It's not good because it can be turned around for the good. It's not good because we can look at the good side of it. It is truly, absolutely good. How? It's a pella. He does it wondrously. And that's why in this world we say Diana Emmets over ill tidings. We cannot recite Hatova Meti that God is good and does acts of good because an ill occurrence expresses judgment and punishment and darkness. A bad thing happened. But at the same time, in a wondrous way that we cannot understand, it is good. Until the future time arrives, we'll be able to comp comprehend how bad is good. The correct way to look at it is Baruch Dayan Emes. But this is not because we are short-sighted. It is not because we fail to take into account the eventual good that will arise. It is because we must wait for the future until it will be revealed that due to an amazing Pella, the things that we had rightly and correctly perceived as bad are actually good. And this is the perception that the Malachim have. The Malachim who are looking, the angels who are looking at the world from the vantage point that we don't have, the Yaakov Avinu on his death de deathbed is able to see how this which is transpiring now is good. Not that it will be good. Not that ultimately I can see the good in it. No! It is the essence of goodness. He therefore translates in 21 in the arrow. In the future, the concept of blessed is Torah Mahuto. It's not only describing God's kingship. Which means in the future. Hashem will be Baruch which will describe the Shleimun HaKaratenu, that we have an understanding that the way Hashem works in this world is Kvod Machuto, which means Kulo Tov, complete goodness. That's what we're missing in this world, my friends. We're missing the Kvod Machuto. We're missing the glory and honor of God's Malchus, which is the way that God interacts with the world. We're missing seeing that that Kavo, that honor, is really the goodness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We feel Baruch Shem, we feel Hashem's presence, and we understand it will be La'olam Vod, it will be forever. But the Kavod Malchus, though, to be able to see the outright outright manifestation of goodness in God's kingdom that we can't see. 
that we can't see in its essence right now. That's concealed from us. That is what the Malachim sing. They who have that vision, that's their Shira to Hashem. On Yom Kippur, when we have a vision of the angels, once a year, when we're able to see the Shema Yisrael at the end of, of, of Hashem Elohim, at the end of a full day, we're able to see it. But right now, where we are, from our vantage point, it hurts. It's difficult. And this perhaps explains the, um, the uh, contradiction the Gemara speaks about of Yeshaya Novins, the 23 of Usher Weiss, describes the angels as having six wings, while Yeskeskel describes them having four wings. So, did they have six wings, or did they have four wings? So the answer is that when the Beis HaMikdash stood, when there was a complete revelation of guiding list, there were six wings. Yechezkel Navi was at the time of the Chorba Beis HaMikdash, the destruction of the Temple, there were four wings. So the Rizal explains that the words, Baruch, Shem, Kvo, Machuso, Lulam, Va'ed, are six words. Those correspond to the six wings. When the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, two of the wings are missing. Which two wings? Well, we just spoke about. The Kvon Machuso. The glory of Hashem's kingship is, is, is in it. And that's how we say in the end of Davening, Galei Kvon Machus Reveal the glory of your kingship upon us. In the hope that the middle wings of the Serafi may soon be extended, that the Beit HaMikdash shall be rebuilt. And that's why the Benish Chayi says when we say in Shema, Kivon Machutcha Yomeru, Ugvuraschcha Yidabeiru, they shall speak the glory of your kingship and tell of your might, that in the future everyone will speak of the mighty deeds that Hashem will perform. Then the wings corresponding to Kivon Machuso will be revealed. But since we don't have Kivon Machuso today, since the wings are gone, since we don't understand how things happen, since we in our eyes and in our mindset see the Chorba, the destruction of the Beit Samikdash, we only have four wings and not six wings, and hence we say the Shema quietly. The Baruch, sorry, we say the Shema out loud, we say the Baruch Shane quietly, because we don't have a full manifestation of Hashem's glory. As the Sifte Chaim speaks about in 25, Kvod Elohim Haster Dother. The glory of God is something that is concealed. The very nature of this world, the way Hashem has built this world, is that we have to be Neman Ruach. What Hashem wants from us is Amuna, is faith. That even in Mechasa Dover, even when we don't understand it, we understand that Hashem is running the show. Kvod Melachim Chakor Dover. It will only be in the future that we'll be able to see the entire picture. And this is for the reasons that, again, are beyond our understanding, Hashem has concealed this from us. So on the first level, we saw that to make a distinction between what's in the Torah and what's in the Torah, the tradition, we say it quietly. The Nefesh Chaim, we say it quietly because what's the praise that Hashem is the king over all of us, tiny, minuscule beings? We say it quietly, the Maharal, because it's beyond our understanding. Baruch Shem is so high. We can reconcile the Maharal and the and the Nefesh HaChayim that is beyond our understanding how Hashem, who is so great, can be a king over us who is so small and be so interested in our lives. But because this is beyond our understanding, we say it quietly. The next approach of why we say it quietly is that this is the Shira of the Malachim. This is the Shira of, of the angels. This is the Shira of a Yaakov Avinu on his deathbed and transition state. But we who live in this world are missing the Kvod Machuso. When something transpires, we feel the pain. Yes, we can say, Yes, we can say, I'm sure there's good in this. But right now, all I see is the negative. Right now, where I'm living, the Kvod Machuso, the manifestation of God's glory, of God's kingship, of God's goodness, is missing for me. Those wings are missing. We ask Hashem, we dive into Hashem, reveal your kingship. And because we do not have a full picture in our world, we have a limited picture in our world. We still say the bracha of Diana Emes, that God is a true judge, and not Hatova Meti, that all is for the good upon hearing bad news. We therefore say this pasuk quietly. I'll just add, and this this level 
Going back a page, a very interesting insight of the Tam Vadas Rav Sternbach. It's a technical point, but an important one, so I'll mention it. Where he says that generally, another difference that we have between our world and the future world is in our world, when we write out Hashem's name, we write it Yud K Vav K, the K being the Hey, right? That's the four letter name of Hashem. We read it as Ado as Adon Hashem, right? We don't read it, we don't know how to pronounce the real name, so we read it as Hashem is my master. Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. But in the future of our Lulam Haba, Kulo, Echa, Nikra, B'yud, Kei, Vav, Kei, the Nechta, B'yud, Kei, Vav, Kei. In the future, it will be read and written as Hashem's real name. Which means, he says, that the essence of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, as the Yud Kei Vav Kei, of Haya Hove Viyeh, God was, God is, and God will be. The totality of Hashem, which means on a deeper level, being able to see the entire picture simultaneously, which is the Kavod Machuso, being able to see God's kingship, is beyond our ability to see in this world. That's why when we come across the Yud Kei Vav Kei in the Siddur, what we should have in mind is that Hashem is, he says, Adon HaKol, Hashem is the Master. The one place where we must have in mind the Yud Kei Vav Kei as not only Hashem is Adon HaKol, the Master, but Hayah Yeah, and if we don't have it in mind, it's Va'ake, where we haven't really fulfilled our obligation, is in the Pasuk of Shema. When we say Shema Yisrael, we have to say Hashem and think in our head, Hashem, the Master of all, and Hashem, who was, will be, who is, and will be, that is the exception. And we know that in the Beit Samigdash, when they would say, when the Kohen Gadol would say the name of Hashem, right, Kish, Kishayu Shomi, Metashem HaMaforosh, Yotzei Pi Kohen Gadol, the Kedusha Batara, they would fall on their face and say, Baruch Shem Kvo Machus Olam So because we right, are thinking Hashem's essence of his name, it's saying Shema. When I just said Shema, and I'm thinking his essence of Hayah Ovevyeh, that God is the totality of all being, so just like in the base of English, when that was said, and the way it was written, the response was Baruch Shem, we who are only thinking this, say Baruch Shem, quietly, we say Balachash, we say it with a whisper. But on the deeper, philosophical level, this is exactly what we're talking about. The Hayah Ovevyeh is seeing perspective when I say the Shema, I have to have this in mind, that the world that I'm living in now, the oneness of Hashem, is limited. There is oneness which is total oneness, where there is nothing else aside from the will of Hashem. I don't see this now. The Kvod Machuso is in it. I say it because that's the vision that I'm ascribing to when I talk about the Yod Kei Vav Kei. But since we don't experience it, we say it quietly. Okay, my friends, if you've been able to survive till now, then we're on easy street. That was enough philosophy that I want to do for, uh, more or less, for, for, for this year. Not to try to come down to earth, bring our parachute down a little bit, because, uh, again, this is very deep. If we're talking about the Shira of Malachim, you know we're on very high level here, my friends. How can we relate to Baruch Shein? On, uh, on more of uh, on the ground down here. So the Nefesh Shimshon, again Rav Finkis, in his Bayer on Tefillah, has a very beautiful insight into what Baruch Shem is about that I think uh, is a little bit more easy to relate to. He says, when we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, that's Katna, 26, but Echad, that's Godless. Echad means that we recognize that everything in this world is a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and that he is Mehavako. He is a Nekudash Elachayim. He is everything. Vuloma Sartashkacha Zulafachad. He didn't give his Hashkacha, his uh, divine providence over to anyone else. Here you thought we finished philosophy. I trick you. No, it's, it, it's doable, my friends. What does this mean? So we know Rabbi Chaim Friedlander in Faith and Divine Providence speaks about it in 27. The Medrash continues, by the word of Hashem, the heavens were made by his expression of will, and by that same word which he created them, they stand forever. That same word which created is what acts constantly to make the heavens stand forever. Therefore it is written, forever Hashem, your word stands in the heaven. Through his will Hashem creates, 
and activate its all creatures, from the smallest to the largest. When we see a small fly moving about, we should contemplate and realize that the Holy One is putting life into it and moving it right now. Furthermore, humans exist and act every minute, only because Hashem continues to activate them. Each and every minute, like the heavens, like the whole creation, we have to understand. The Dvaracha, the word of Hashem, is uh, is standing in every moment. Dvaracha, Nitzav Hashemayim, and this is what is it's allowing us to function, to move, to be creative. So when we say Shema Yisrael, we op- are open to this gift that Hashem gives us, this gift of being able to in 28, the Emes Lamisa, the truth. That Hashem is a source of all that happens in this world. He's a master of everything that happens in this world. He's concerned about everything that happens in this world. He is the one who will never change. This is the fundamental principle of our faith, the fundamental principle of Yiddishkeit. But that's the Shema. That's what Hashem gives to us. That is what we take on when we say the Shema. But you know what? We haven't given anything back to Hashem. We've just restated what is obvious. And he gives a mushroom. He says, it's like a, a, a parent who asks the child, could you bring me a cup of water? And the child goes ahead and brings a cup of tea. He gives more than he was asked for. Our response of Baruch Shem is our response to the Shema Yisrael. It's our way of responding to Hashem. Let's take a look in 31. Echad omer lanu et hamet lamita et ha'enor bevado ha'gadlus. When we say Shema Yisrael, Shem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, I realize that there is no other being except for Hashem, which gets into the whole idea of do we really exist if Hashem is everything, but not for today. So kol kakado. But if you were to think about this, that God is the only reality in this world, it's hard to exist, it's hard to go on. It's like a lightning bolt that comes down to you. But how do you live with this reality? That's why we come and say, Baruch Shem Kvah Machus Olamved. Mao Shem Mai Malchus. It's our way of being able to connect to Hashem. And therefore, in 32, after we've made this statement, we turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kilo and we say, Hashem, we want to live with you. We know the truth is that you are the only one. But as soon as we leave the shul, what happens? Right, going back to the Hanukkah imagery. We're back in the darkness. We go back to our routine. How do we able to take the Shema Yisrael and bring it into our lives? On this level, is very concrete. We say to Hashem, Open up the bracha of Echad into our lives. That shem kvo machutecha shinakira tamachutshecha. Help us be able to recognize your kingship. Help us to be able to see how you are involved in our lives at every moment. Laolam vaed belik vul without any uh, barriers. Baruch Shem Zahachelek Shelanu Bekriachma. Zu Maskala Shelanu Bekablado Machut Shemayim. This is what we bring to the Shema Yisrael. And that's why we say it quietly. We say it quietly because this is, he said, our inner desire. Ritzona Pemishal Yudi. The Shema Yisrael is that major statement. There is none other. And then quietly we turn to Hashem with the Bakasha and we say, Hashem, Help me be able to live this reality. Help me be able, and everywhere we go, to feel your presence. Allow this baruch, this this hafshata, this ability to expand your name, your essence, the your clothes, your glory, your kingship, the essence of who you are in every part of our lives. Hashem, allow me to feel you, and this is our request from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And since it's not what Hashem has commanded us, we don't say it out loud. We say it quietly. But this is our fervent request to Hashem. As um, Rabbi Victor Miller, in the Sefer of Victor Miller speaks, 35, he says, as we, as 
we see plan and purpose in the world while we study the design in the world little by little. We become aware of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. The purpose is to eventually walk with Hashem in our lives. It's not enough for us to believe. It's not enough just to say Shema. It should become part of our being. That's Baruch Hashem. Part of our thinking and feeling, whether we walk in our streets or we sit in the office, Hashem is there. Even if a man goes to the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. Even on his deathbed, man is comforted by the knowledge that Hashem is with him. It is not a chaotic, purposeless world in which finally a person has to die. Sometimes before his time, people are so embittered that this tragedy happened to him. On the contrary, Hashem is with him, holding his hand and walking with him into the world to come, to remain with him forever. Learning to feel the awareness of Hashem is one of the greatest achievements of life. Every move we make should be the most correct move possible, because the king is looking. A few pages later, he knows, on page 154, in the Sefer, on source 36, So what does Hashem want of you? Kim lirat Hashem. To learn how to fear Hashem. To be aware of Hashem at all times. That's why we pray. By praying you become aware that there's someone who's listening to you. That's why we keep mitzvot. Someone is commanding us. We're answerable for our behavior. That's why we have the Torah. The entire Torah teaches us that we're responsible for our acts. These are all lessons to train us in the great achievement of becoming aware of Hashem. That's Yura. The first thing that Hashem requires of you, and we have not even begun to study this subject, We've only explained the basis. Ki'im lirat Hashem, to be able to feel Hashem. And we know Yira and Re'iya are the same letters. To be able to see Hashem, Akol Sad Vishal, to be able to feel Hashem, to see Hashem at every point of our lives. So my friends, and this first aspect, this first whole level of what Baruch Shem is about, there are two parts. Part number one is Baruch Shem is the Shira of the Malachim, is to be able to see Hashem in this world is impossible for us. Only on Yom Kippur can we say this out loud. We're living in a world where Kavod Elohim Haster Davar, where so much is concealed from us. We say it quietly. We recognize our limitations, that we feel the pain in this world. We don't see how this, in an essence, is good. The second part of this is that we do say Baruch Shem out loud, I mean quietly, is our part to Hashem. That albeit we don't see the whole picture, albeit this is the shira of the Malachim, it's still our fervent request. Hashem, we may not be able to see everything. We recognize that we're limited in what we see. But the flip side is, Hashem, we don't want to be out in the dark. We want to be able to somehow take that Shema Yisrael and make it part of my life. Hashem, help me to the extent that I'm able to be able to see you, to be able to feel you. Hashem, Roi, Hashem, allow you to be my friend, to walk with me wherever I go, to feel that your presence is there wherever I go, to feel that you are watching me, that you care about me, that I'm like, as the Chavos Bovos say, an only child, that the love for me is a tremendous amount of love. Hashem, allow me not only to know this philosophically of Shema Yisrael, but to be able to implement this and to concretize this in my life in the Baruch Shem. And therefore, Yaakov Avinu's response, when the brother said, Shema Yisrael, his response is wonderful that you are on this level of seeing Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, Halavai Vaiter. Now, Baruch Shem, be able to put this in your lives. This is the introduction to the Brachos. You want to know what's going to be in the future? You want to know what path you're going to need to take? Whatever path it is, whatever I'm going to say to each brother to emphasize their positive or point out their negative traits, you have to know one thing beforehand. And that's Baruch Shem, Kvam Machus Olam Ve'ed. And that's a recognition and understanding that Kvam Baruch Hu has to be part and parcel of your life at all times. His manifestation of His Kvam Machus of His kingship, of His glory, the way He manifests in this world, has to be part of you at all times. That, my friends, is aspect number one of Baruch Shem being above us, but yet, as above us as it is, we try to grasp onto it to be able to implement it in our lives. I'd like to share two other 
totally different from what we've seen and different from each other approaches to why Burr of Shame is mentioned quietly. And I'd like to bring these down, as we've done in the past, to see the multiplicity of learning and how you could take a look at a metrish and understand it on many, many different levels, and that all the different levels teach us different lessons. So what we've learned so far is probably the classic lesson of Baruch Shem. Now let's take a look at some not-so-classic ways of understanding this dialogue of Shema Yisrael and Baruch Shem. And I chose two that I think have, as what is... My mitama, my goal, would have some moral lessons and implications for our lives. The first will be the Chaim Moshe. The second will be a Hasidic approach, Philip Pinchas, uh, Pinchas Friedman, a little bit of Bell's Torah. Let's take a look, source 37. Chaim Moshe speaks about a medrash, which says when Hashem wanted to create the world and create Adam, the Malachim had their opinions, the angels, whether they, he should be created or not. Um, so Chesed said, kindness said, create, him, because the person will do a lot of acts of kindness. Emes says, truth said, don't create him, because he's full of lies. Zedek said, you should create him, he'll do a lot of righteousness. Shalom says, don't create him. Peace says, don't create him, it's going to be a lot of uh, discord. We know Beta Tikkun, at the time of Achri Sayyamim, the Ikara Tikkun will be, as the Pasuk and Zechariah said, Ha'emet shalom havu, of peace and love, you should embrace it, you should know, that we know that the Navi Micha, as well as Yishaya Navi, describe the time of the future, Vikititu, Kravatam, Litim, Vichanutei, and Lamasai wrote, that they will, you know, beat their uh, swords into plowshares and, uh, and uh, you know, use it as farming equipment. You know, I'll just mention here parenthetically, I remember in the early 1990s, I was listening on the way to work to uh, CBS radio, and uh, I used to like listening to the Osgood file, and uh, I remember, like, I nearly got into a crash. I remember exactly where I was, where he spoke about this pasuk, and he spoke about how in Russia, at that time, the early 1990s, they didn't need all of the tanks and all of these uh, weapons because of, you know, the peace. And they were melting them down into using them for farming equipment. I mean, I was like, wow. Remember, I was in L.A., I, I nearly crashed into a pole. Like, this is it. The, 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 uh, the Yeshaya Hanavi's uh, Navua coming true. This is the time that we have to hope for. The time of, of, of peace. What are the two components that will characterize the Achri Sayyamin? The two components which were understandably prophesied that would be missing in this world. The idea of truth and the idea of peace. Now, Kamal Kain, 38, Yetikuna MS, the, the peace will obviously be Eliyahu Navi will come and bring peace. And the truth will be a time when everyone will know. We say in Yom Kippur Davening, Rosh Hashanah Davening, the Yedah Kol Pol Keshem Pol Lo, Pol To. Everyone will know that Hashem created him. And then, Pasuk Etzanya, Hashem will turn all the nations to call in the name of Hashem, Lav Dol Shechem Echad. Now, after Yaakov Avinu has established this principle of truth, where his children are clear about the oneness of Hashem, he felt, that now is the time to bring Mashiach. So B.K. Shaqov Leishev Shalva. he wanted to live in peace, which means he wanted to bring the time of, of tranquility. And Kafatul Avrov Zoshal Yosef, it wasn't time, the whole disunity of the family happened. Okay, so that wasn't time to bring the Mashiach. So he figures now they're living in Mitzrayim. It was 17 years, Tov, goodness. And he feels now that all the past has been forgotten. Now's the time to bring Mashiach. So he turns to, he sees that there's outer peace, right? Everyone's getting along well. So he says, the only thing now is I have to make sure that there's MS, there's truth. So he's about to tell them the future. He's about to, in a certain way, try to bring about the redemption. And he's stuck on him and it, it left him. He says, oh my gosh, maybe there's no truth here. Because I feel the peace. So which they said, no, Shema Yisrael. In 40, that just like he, just like you are the meat of MS, we too 
are holding by MS. There's no psul. The truth is here. We understand Shema Yisrael. That's not the problem. Why Mashiach isn't here is because we still haven't gotten rid of that Sinas Chinam, that baseless hatred. And that's why he wasn't able to bring down the Kate. Nevertheless, he said, Baruch Shem Kval Machus Olam Ve'en, which is the Sheva, which we say in the base of Midash, because he says, if we already have truth, so then I daven that now peace should reign in this world, that Hashem should bring down, the Baruch Shem was a tefillah, that the Malchus of Hashem should come down, and he should be able to bring down the world of peace, and let this be the world of, uh, of Tikkun. The asterisk of 41. Why do we say Baruch Shem every time we daven? Because when we say Shema, because when we say Shema, we're once again re-emphasizing this truth of Shema Yisrael. There's only one reality. And at that moment, when we're so clear about the truth, what's missing from bringing the Mashiach is only Shalom. So we like Yaakov Avinu David, let their Shalom reign in this world. Baruch Shem. Hashem, please bring down this Mita of Shalom. And that is why we say it quietly. Because we know that Chasrami does a Shalom. We know we're missing Shalom. The Kenayu Lanu, double on line in 41, we're embarrassed that we don't have Shalom. We're embarrassed we can't get along with our neighbors. We're embarrassed that we can't get along with our family. We're embarrassed about this. This isn't the way it should be. So Yaakov, he knew, said it out loud because he really felt that this was going to bring down the Shefa of Shalom, of peace. We have to say it quietly, because we're embarrassed that we're not in a state of peace, that we have to dive in, that we should have peace. And that's why on Yom Kippur, we say it out loud, because we know, you know, sin of a low kin of a Yom Kippur is a day where everyone gets along, where everyone's in peace with each other, where everyone is made up. So Yom Kippur is the one day of year where we know that the Midah of Emos is there, and the Midah of Shalom is there, and we're able to say it out loud. And this is, uh, we know, time based of Mikdash, second base of Mikdash, they were learning Torah, they were doing Midas Chesed, what was missing? The Midas HaShalom. And that's what, when we say Baruch Shem, what we should be thinking about is Hashem, please bring down the Tefillah of Yaakov Avinu, the Shefa of your Kavod into this world, the full glory of into this world, bring Mashiach, help us reign Shalom in this world, inspire us with the uh, Hashem Yevarech et Amo B'Shalom, that Hashem should bless us with this, uh, this aspect of peace, um, um, and not necessarily through our Yagiyah. So when Yaakov Avinu said, Baruch Shem, it was his way of hoping that, yes, I have truth here, but I'm missing Shalom. Hashem, please bring down Shalom. We will sit down and then we say, Baruch Shem, we're asking Hashem to bring down Hashem Yivarech Adam Oba Shalom. Please bring down the truth. But we have to be a Kli who's going to be ready to accept, please bring down peace. But we have to be a Kli ready to accept this peace. We have to be ready to make amends. We have to be ready to forgive. And in then such a world when we say the Shema and we say Baruch Shem, we're really opening ourselves up to indeed feeling the revelation of godliness and that we should live in the perfected world and Mashiach should come. Our final um, idea of Baruch Shem, and then we'll, we'll end with two uh, small ideas, Merit Hashem. A Hasidic understanding, and again, I bring it so to see the multiplicity and depth of learning, is that the Sefer Amor Torah from Mekubal points out that in Shema Yisrael and Baruch Shem, there are three times the letter Ayin. Ayin is literally the Ayin in Shema, Shin Mem Ayin. Right? In um, the Baruch Shem, you have Le'olam, the Ayin in Le'olam, and Va'ed. And Ayin is also uh, literally an eye, right? A nine. Ayin is an eye. So he says, why there are three Ayins in Shema Baruch Shem? This parallels in 43 in the asterisk. The Mishnah in Perkei Avos is the first Mishnah in Perkei Avos. The Kav Yabim Mahalo said, look at three things and you won't come to sin. No. Where you come from? Um, know where you're going, and know in front of whom you have to give a, uh, a judgment. Where you come from, that's the, I, the, um, the fact that you stand in front of 
לפני, מעתה לא נפלאתי לומר, כי זה הרבה יותר גימל פעמים עוד עין שנזכרו בשני פסוקי היחוד. These two פסוקים, which is about the oneness of Hashem, has our three mindsets that we need to have. The Shema Yisrael, who Rashi Tevos, Su'u Maro Menech. Shema is, look at from where your uh, look, so my Roman Nechem, look and lift up your eyes. So um my Roman Nechem, Urema Thai Stakler, but I ain't clap a mala, la shem, if he not with the mea tate, the tain thing the cheshbon. No, in front of whom you're going to have an accountant. The I in a bar of shame, the Olam Vaed, are the other two. La Ola means where you've come from, my I in Bata. And Vaed is a hit Vaadot is see where you are going. to place of words. So the Shema Yisrael is the ultimate one in front of whom you're going to have a, a judgment. The Bar of Shame are two what we call more minor lookings. Look where you came from. You came from nothing. Look where you're going. A place of words. Like don't make yourself into something greater than you are. And he says, when Adam Arisha, it's a very, very long essay that Mamish is stilling down, almost doing it injustice. Not almost, am doing it injustice. When, when, Yaak, when Adam Arisha sinned, he sinned because he missed out with that ayin. He didn't know that he was going to have to give a deen v'cheshbon in front of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And that's why after he sinned, v'tipakach na'enei shneihem ve'edu kerumim heim. Their eyes were open. Because now suddenly they have to look at Baruch Shem from Achuso. They have to look at where they're coming from and where they're going. Adam Arisho didn't come from a Tipras Rucha. He wasn't going to die. He wasn't going to his grave. He didn't have to look at those two, right? He was great from the end of God. All he had to focus it on was one eye in, was one eye, knowing in front of whom you're giving a judgment. He messed up on that eye. Now we need to have the other two. And that's why when we say Shema Yisrael, Sa'uma Romanech, and we look up and we realize that we have a din v'cheshbon, we have an accounting. If Hashem is the ultimate, then anything we do outside of this, outside the God's reality, has an accounting. But then we say quietly, Baruch Shem, that as a result of the sin of Adam Arisha, we now have two other eyes that have to keep us in check. We don't say it out loud because in the perfect world, had Adam not sinned, we wouldn't have needed these two reminders. And that is, know where you come from, know where you're going. The Baruch Shem are the two eyes that have to keep us in check, that we have to realize that uh, when I look at not only in front of whom do I have a judgment, but from where I've come from and from where I'm going, there's no way I can become too haughty, and it allows me to have the humility that I need to have. This idea that the Baruch Shem is about having this humility, the Baruch Shem is about knowing where you've come from and where you're going, the Baruch Shem is a recognition of the Yichud Hashem, the oneness of Hashem, and where I'm I at vis-a-vis this oneness. This explains what Rav Shwab on prayer notes in 46. I was once asked what thought a person should have while saying Baruch Shem Kvam Achusam. I answered while doing so he should imagine himself at the base of Mikdash, prostrated before Kaddish Baruch with arms and legs outstretched in total submission to the will of Kaddish Baruch Hu, just as we do in Yom Kippur, doing the Vodah and the Tefillah Mosaf. The idea of prostrating oneself with arms and legs outstretched in the base of Mikdash is that the person doing so becomes part of the base of Mikdash, which is dedicated completely to the service of Kaddish Baruch Hu. As such, the person expresses a thought that he is prepared to give up his ego, his self, completely to Hashem, and is even ready to sacrifice his life, if necessary, for Kodesh Baruch Hu. And that's really the balance of Shema Yisrael and Baruch Shem. Shema Yisrael, recognize the reality of Hashem. When I recognize that reality, Baruch Shem allows me to have this certain humility that Hashem's kingdom is found everywhere. I need to know where I've come from, where I'm going. I need to know where my place is. That total prostration, that total annulment of self, that is what is necessary for me to be able to put the Shema Yisrael into my life. To be able to have the perspective, if God is everything, Baruch Shei means that the sanctification of God's name is found when I know my humility and my place. I'll just add, one hour on the Shvila Pinchas will summarize and end with one idea, Mir Tzashem. Shvila Pinchas, a lot of Torah on the Shvila Pinchas. But one of the points that he adds at the end, which I think 
explains a lot mm-hmm. is that David HaMelech was a tikkun for Adam Harisho. David Amela, who says, Shivisti Hashem Lunevi Tami, I place Hashem in Tehillim, I place Hashem in front of me at all times. He was somebody who was able to attack it on some level. He was able to fix that pagam, that uh, defect, again, on some level of Adam Harisho, of not having Hashem's awareness at all times. And therefore, no wonder when the Medrash says that Adam Harisho gave 70 years of his life to David Amela, right? David Amela lived 70 years, and they said, that it was a gift from Adam. A 70 is the matter of Ayin. Of Ayin, the letter Ayin. But as we see, since David HaMelech had the Ayin, the Ah, the Shivis, the Hashem, the Negdi Tami, which Adam HaRishon was missing, it's only befitting that those 70 years of Ayin, of I, were given to him as a gift of Tikkun. So my friends, what have we tried to see? A very, very challenging shear, I will grant you that. A Baruch Shem. What is this about? On the one hand, when I say Baruch Shem, I should believe that this is realizing that this is the shear of the Malachim. That Hashem, who is so great to be found in our world, we don't understand it. Hashem is so great that everything that He does is called Avid Rahman Tav Avid. It's for the good. I can't see it now as being intrinsically good. I whisper Baruch Shem. I say it so quietly that it's not even audible to me. I say it quietly because I recognize my limitation on what I'm able to understand in this world. I am limited. That's the bar of shame of the prostration. I'm limited in my understanding. I don't know Hashem's full way of working in this world. But, having said that, on the level that I am on, I daven. Baruch Shem, Hashem, allow your kingship to be revealed in this world. Allow me to see you. Allow me to feel you, occult Savishal. I can't walk around with Shemites too big to carry. I need something that I can hold on to. Your kvon machuso, the way I see you in a flower, in a fruit, the way I see you interact, the hashgacha pratit I feel in my life, the way I see you're with me at every step of the way, that's what I'm asking from you, Hashem. Allow me to feel you. Allow me to see you. Allow me to have the ability to tap into your energy, kivyacho, at every step of my way. And that's almost this dialectic that we have. On the one hand, he's beyond us. On the other hand, he's very much with us. You see that dialectic on the same second level as well. When we have this MS, we have this truth, we almost feel like it's, it's, it's so real that we can bring Mashiach, Hashem Oz, Lamo Yitain, Hashem Yivarech, et Amo Vashalom, just bring this down. But on the other level, we have so much animosity and strife in our life that we're on able to. On the one hand, it seems to be so real that if I have this truth, why can't I dive into Hashem to bring down the peace? On the other hand, I struggle with this peace, and I don't have this peace within me, and therefore I'm not yet ready to have this level of Baruch shame to be said out loud, and for the ability for Mashiach to indeed come. On the one hand, this is what I want. On the other hand, I'm not yet ready for it. On the one hand, this is something beyond. On the other hand, it's very much in my hands to be able to rectify and to fix. The next level, the Shema is about in front of whom you're giving a Din B'cheshbon. But recognize that the Baruch Shem are the smaller aspects, the secondary aspect of knowing where we come from and where we're headed. That should put us in our place to be able to feel what life is all about. That as great as I am, that I am the one who's going to have the ability to to uh, have a din v'cheshbon on every one of my actions. Hashem cares about each and every one of my actions. Look how amazing and great I am. On the other hand, I come from nothing and I go to nothing. Again, that dialectic of playing with the high and the lofty and the low and the sublime. And I think that this is reflected as our final idea in what Rav Asher Weiss brings down, where he says in 47, the soul of a Jew longs throughout the year to call out Baruch Shem, to publicize Hashem's glory throughout the world. How can we contain our fervor to sanctify Hashem's holy name? Perhaps for this reason, our sages tell us that we should call out in a loud voice, Yeheshve Rabba Mevorach Olam Va'et. May His great name be blessed for all eternity during Kaddish. If a person does so, any harsh decrees that have been written against him will be rescinded. 
And again, there's some that say for 70 years, which is interesting. This phrase from Kaddish parallels Baruch Shem Kvo Machus Olam Ba'ed from Shema. Both have precisely the same meaning. In fact, the Targum Yerushalmi in our Parsha states that Yaakov responded, Yehei Shmei Rabba Baruch Lo Olam Ba'ed, upon, upon hearing his sons recite Shema. We see from here that the meaning is one and the same. Well, the Gemara says Baruch Shem, as we saw, Targum Yerushalmi says, Yehei Shmei Rabba. Since we are as yet unable to say Baruch Shem Kvo Machuso Lulam Ba'ed out loud, as in our heart's desire, that we want to have the manifestation of godliness. We want to have the world where we're able to see the Machus of Hashem. Galei Kvo Machus Ha'aleinu. Kvo Machus Ha'aleinu. We want to have this. We want to speak about this. We want this. This is our desire. We want to bring down the peace into this world. We want Baruch Shem to be screamed out. We want this reality to be so clear in our lives. But it isn't. So instead... We must say instead that the Heshmei Rabbah, the Aramaic equivalents, and angels do not understand Aramaic, or according to some opinions they pay no heed, there's no concern that we might incite their envy by reciting the Aramaic rendition of their prayer. Right? We don't say it in Hebrew, because we don't want to have the angels envious of us. But Aramaic is not a problem. So therefore, in a real sense, we have the Baruch Shem said very quietly, which is our deep desire that the it should be manifested. But we're not on the level of the angels. We're not there yet. But we can answer Amen Yeheshmei Rabbah really loudly in Aramaic, which is saying the same thing. And there we're able to give over our passion and our desire, Hashem, and our fervor. Sanctify your holy name in this world. Bring about a time where it will be so clear the sanctification of your name. Bring about a time where we don't have to say this quietly anymore. Bring about that tikkun, that ultimate redemption, which Yaakov Avinu originally intended when he wanted to reveal the end of times. Allow our Amen Yehishmei Rabba and our quiet Baruch Shem being, representing this dialectic of our desire and our struggle to be able to have a resolution where Hashem's redemption will come, it will be revealed in an open and manifested way, and we'll be able to see for the here and now how cold the Avid Rahman everything Hashem does is good. He is the essence of goodness and will be able to have back that fifth and sixth wings of Kavod Machuso, of the glory of Hashem's kingdom in this world.